Well, so far we've covered situations especially associated with low light levels and <clears throat> talked about how low light levels can be stressful. But there also are situations where excessive light uh, can be a problem. And this relates to or is sometimes referred to as photo inhibition. And that re refers to situations when photosynthetically active radiation exceeds the capacity of uh, especially the dark reactions to process energy, to process that photosynthetic energy that's captured. Uh, when that happens, electrons get tran transferred to oxygen but energy is not transferred photosynthetically. So that excess energy can damage photosystems. Sorry about that terrible hand, handwriting, but <clears throat> the, these situations tend to be more likely under environmental stresses which reduce the ability of the dark reactions to process energy. So for instance, situations like nutrient stress, if there's not enough nitrogen or phosphorus available to um, you know, make enzymes for the dark reactions, that can be a problem. Uh, drought stress, extreme drought stress can do that, but also cold. So this picture uh, is an example of photo inhibition in young pines after a cold snap or a cold period in Florida. Of course, Florida, in Florida we have mild winters, um, but we do periodically get cold weather. And when we get cold weather, um, that you know, reduces the ability of the dark reactions to process energy, but it remains sunny often. So those leaves are, are taking in photosynthetically active radiation, but they can't process that energy through the dark reactions. And that can actually end up doing things like bleaching chlorophyll. You know, that's not a happy looking tree. It's really yellow. And in this particular situation, uh, it really demonstrated that this was a photo inhibition situation for a couple of reasons. One of them was that the effects were more apparent on the south side of the tree, on the sunny side of the tree. So this is the north side of that tree and you can see the needles are fairly green. But on the south side of the tree, the needles are really yellow. So the bleaching was occurring primarily on the sunny, south side of the tree. So sort of a classic example of photo inhibition. Another situation where sometimes photo inhibition is implicated is uh, with thinning shock. If 
thinning shock is just a phenomenon where uh, a stand is thinned and for some period of time afterwards, maybe a year, maybe a couple of years, the residual trees actually slow their growth. So of course the purpose of thinning almost always is to increase growth rate in residual trees, but occasionally after thinning we see a reduction in growth rate. And there's you know a number of hypothesized reasons that can happen. Could be damage from logging, impact to roots, could be exposure of soil and drying out of soil, but one potential explanation for thinning shock is photoinhibition in lower leaves. So if you have, you know, a stand of trees where the trees are growing close together, in those situations, these lower parts of the crown um, are fairly shaded. But then if we you know, kill half the trees in a thinning and open up these trees to radiation, those uh, leaves on the lower branches are suddenly exposed to bright sunlight. They are not acclimated to that bright sunlight and they may become photo inhibited. So that essentially uh, damages the ability to do photosynthesis on some significant amount of the crown and the trees essentially have to grow new leaves that are acclimated to those brighter light conditions. So uh, photo inhibition is, is another hypothesized cause for thinning shock. One tool that can be used to analyze photo inhibition and a number of other factors that impact photosystem two in the light reactions is chlorophyll fluorescence. Chlorophyll fluorescence measures fluorescence as, it, as its name implies. So recall that when chlorophyll absorbs a photon and moves into an excited state by capturing the energy from that photon, one of three things can happen. One is photochemistry. So electron transport, light reactions happen, that energy is, is trans, transferred uh, in the light reactions and used in the dark reactions to fi fix carbon. That's the um, you know, beneficial outcome of the capture of a photon by chlorophyll. But in addition, um, that excited state can drop down and emit a small amount of heat. So emit that energy as heat or emit a photon in a slightly longer wavelength. That third option is fluorescence, okay? So by measuring the amount of fluorescence, we can indirectly um, estimate the efficiency of number one, of photochemistry, of the light reactions, um, as well as a number of other parameters. This, uh, this technique has been developed over the years to measure a whole host of attributes associated with photosystems, but the simplest is to use the parameters shown in that graph uh, to calculate the ratio of FV to FM. And in, you know, let's just call it fully functional photosystem two, FV to FM equals 0 0.8. So that's pretty consistent. Uh, so 
chlorophyll fluorescence is a quick way to assess the functioning and health of photosystem 2. When FV to FM goes down, as in this graph, that's an indication that um, there's something wrong with photosystem 2, like photoinhibition, for instance. So, you know, this is healthy or fully functional photosystem 2 and reductions in FEFM below that actually show an increase in fluorescence, which means uh, a smaller proportion of the energy captured from photons is going through photochemistry and a larger proportion is being fluoresced. Um, and that can be due to any of a number of reasons, one, one of which is photoinhibition. So a number of stresses can be on the photosystems can be detected relatively easily with chlorophyll fluorescence. It's a relatively straightforward measurement. So um, it's a quick physiological index of the health of photosystem two. Leaves have a number of mechanisms to protect photosystems from, for instance, excessive light. And one of those is the xanthophyll cycle. The xanthophyll cycle involves the production of ultimately zeaxanthin, uh, which acts as a lightning rod for excessive excitation energy that can't be processed by the dark reactions. So this zeaxanthin here absorbs excess excitation energy that can't be handled by the photosystems. But obviously, it's not beneficial to have zeaxanthin around when there is not excess light, because it would then absorb excitation energy that could otherwise be used in uh, photochemistry. So this process, the activation of zeaxanthin or the transformation of zeaxanthin from, for instance, viola xanthin and, and theraxanthin, which are other carotenoids, uh, is triggered by excess light. So those transformations occur um, under high light and high rates of photosynthesis. And, and they're triggered by acidification of the thylakoid lumen. lumen. So recall that during photosynthesis, uh, remember this is a, a diagram of the thylakoid membrane, that during the light reactions, water is split to produce hydrogen ions. And that, so that when the light reactions are occurring rapidly, there's lots of H plus being formed in the thylakoid lumen. And that of course then acidifies the thylakoid lumen. So that acidification is one of the main signals that signals the, that basically is a signal that, okay, photosynthesis is churning along at a rapid rate near capacity. And at that point, the xanthophyll cycle kicks in and um, zeaxanthin is formed and acts as sort of a lightning rod for those excess for that excess um, excitation energy. So that acidification of the lumen is sort of the signal that allows that transformation and then the scavenging of that additional um, excitation energy. Now, obviously humans have observed bright colors in fall foliage for forever, <laughs> um, but it's only relatively recently that we have a better understanding of all of the um, adaptive benefits of fall coloring. Now, some of the fall colors result from when chlorophyll, which reflects green, starts breaking down, it reveals other col 
colors from other pigments such as carotenoids, for instance, which uh, maybe are yellow. Um, but in addition, some of the brighter colors like the reds and sometimes even purples are, um, so let me back up, those, some of those carotenoids uh, are, for instance, auxiliary photosynthetic pigments. They capture photons and transfer them to the reaction center. So those are just being reve revealed as chlorophyll is broken down. But some of the colors, like I said, bright reds, purples, and so on, those uh, are caused by anthocyanins. The interesting thing about anthocyanins is that they don't occur in chloroplasts like carotenoids, for instance. Anthocyanins occur in the vacuole of cells. So here's a plant cell and you know the cell wall, here's the chloroplasts, and here's the vacuole of the cell. Well, those anthocyanins are in the vacuole. So clearly they don't serve a photosynthetic, a direct photosynthetic purpose. They are not transferring energy uh, to reaction centers like accessory pigments and chloroplasts might be. So there's been some puzzling. Well, then is there an adaptive benefit to anthocyanins? And the consensus now is that anthocyanins basically help to protect the chloroplasts from photo inhibition during leap, both leaf senescence, when chlorophyll is breaking down. You can imagine as chlorophyll is breaking down, nitrogen and other nutrients are being retranslocated out of the leaves. There's a lessened capacity for um, the light reactions and then dark reactions of photosynthesis. Um, but there's still some photosynthesis going on. So it's thought that anthocyanins basically help to capture some of those photons and screen them from the chloroplasts and keep the chloroplast from being photo inhibited basically during the last stages of senescence. And that allows a little bit more carbon to be fixed during that period of senescence. In addition, so, you know, th this is a senescent leaf here, right? So this is important during senescence, but it also happens during leaf formation. You know, here's a, a vine growing up uh, the wall of my house, and these are the newly formed leaves on the vine. These are the more mature leaves. These are the newly formed leaves where um, the leaves are still expanding, chloroplasts are still being produced, chlorophyll is, is building up. Those leaves also have high concentrations of anthocyanins in their vacuole. And the purpose or the benefit is similar in that those anthocyanins are screening those chloroplasts from photoinhibition during that period of development when the capacity to handle excitation uh, energy is low. So anthocyanins protect leaves both during their initial phase of expansion and then also during senescence to allow um, carbon fixation to occur and continue during those times in the life of the leaf.